from a passage from Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Quote, You can buy a person's hand, but you can't buy his heart. His heart is where his enthusiasm, his loyalty is. You can buy his back, but you can't buy his brain. That's where his creativity is, his ingenuity, his resourcefulness. When visions are shared, says Joe Barker, they become a force in people's hearts. And when people commit together, visions become real and can change the world. Before I move on to what we believe is another critical component of making visions real, I'd like to share a few suggestions which professionals have offered in the creation of visions. A good place to start may be with a personal vision. A technique which Stephen Covey suggests is try to imagine yourself at your 80th birthday party. That's an image. Or your 50th wedding anniversary. Visualize yourself surrounded by friends, loved ones, and associates from all walks of life. Include as much detail as you can. The place, the ambiance, the faces of the people. Picture these individuals in your mind, one by one, paying tribute to you. Assume that each one represents a role you are playing in life, such as that of a leader, a parent, a coach, a counselor, a teacher, a researcher. Also assume you have fulfilled these roles with your complete potential. What would these people be saying? What qualities of character would you be remembered for? What outstanding contributions would they mention? Looking at them, what important difference have you made in their lives? As you imagine, try writing down your roles, and beside each, jot down what tribute statement you would like to be said of you at this event. How do you feel when you look at this vision of what your life could represent? While this is a quick exercise, it will give you some insight into the potential power and passion of vision. Developing visions with groups follow some of the same principles, but are generally facilitated. Teams use multiple techniques to answer such questions as, what is the purpose of the group? What is the group's driving force? What are its core values? What does it do best? What do they want to accomplish? What do we want to change? A process our team particularly likes is one which was developed by Bill Belgard of Belgard Fisher and Rayner Incorporated. For establishing a new vision for an organization, they present six steps. First, establish the current operational position, a system. As I discussed, there are commonly held visions in all organizations, even if they are not defined. To discover what the current version might be, first, Bill Gard suggests observing the artifacts. What do the physical things tell you about an organization? Do people have their doors closed frequently? Or is the office open in environment, very open? What types of media do people have hanging on the walls of their offices? Second, observe their behavior. Do you see groups of people discussing customer issues or office politics? Thirdly, come to some conclusions about what you believe the beliefs to be based on your org on your observations. Your conclusion will be an understanding of the vision which is actually driving the organization. Secondly, develop a case for change. The idea is to describe why is it important to change current behaviors. It answers the questions of why change? What is likely to happen if we do, don't change? How will employees benefit from the change? The third step, define the characteristics of a good vision. How do these apply to your situation and your team? The fourth step is together develop a vision of greatness for the organization and work as a team to do it. The fifth step, 
establish personal commitments to the vision. Think about and plan how you will act to demonstrate your being committed to the vision each day. I'll talk more about commitment shortly. Step six, develop a communications plan. The plan is not just an announcement of the new vision, but a plan which includes a description of the current vision, the case for change, which is step two, the new vision, step three and four, and how people will recognize the leader's commitment, what they can expect, step five. Our teams use this approach to define their team visions. Once you've completed your vision, Peter Senge offers the following ideas on gaining enrollment and commitment. First, be enrolled yourself. You're not selling people on the vision. You're enrolling, offering them a free choice to join. Secondly, be on the level. Tell them the truth. State the vision honestly and don't hide from the problems you know exist. Thirdly, let the other person choose. It is the choice of the person joining, remember. If they choose it, they take ownership of it. We've reviewed the qualities of vision and some of the ways you might consider developing a vision for yourself and your organization. In the second portion of my presentation, I will speak about values and strategies, the other two key components of strategic vision, and address some of the difficulties in implementation. Now we have the first question and answer session. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Therefore, we ask that you only ask one question at a time per phone call and that these questions be as brief as possible. You can call directly our studio at, at the fax number or phone numbers that you have on the screen. And now the first question is coming from Villahermosa, Tabasco, from Pemex, Mexican Petroleum. Good morning. This is Patricia Castañeda speaking from the management office here in Tabasco. The question is the following. Desire, imagination, ideals are interesting concepts for a vision, but in a corporation, reality about laws and regulations sometimes frustrates these ideals of the vision. What are your suggestions about that? I believe that as you are um, considering a vision for a business, uh, one of the things that you clearly have to also understand is the context in which you're operating. And the context in the uh, context of the question, I believe, is the regulations or the state and the governments. Uh, I don't believe that a vision is something that, as, as you recall, I earlier stated, that one of the things a vision has to be is something that can be achieved or realistic. And that was one of the key components that I think that uh, Warren Bennis uh, and Mr. Nannis had uh, mentioned as well. Uh, so there has to be something that can be achievable. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be achievable outside of the confines of the law. We all have laws and, and countries and, and uh, limitations that we're dealing with. So I, again, I'm suggesting that it's realistic within the confines of the environment which you uh, are doing business. I think you might find that there are differences, however, that can be achieved as you become a global business. As I think of our own business uh, in its global expansion, there are things that we can't achieve at this point in some of the countries we're operating. However, that doesn't mean it holds us back from attempting to assist the organizations to understand why we want to accomplish what we want to accomplish and how it will assist them uh, as they try to achieve their objectives. So I think it's not a limiter. It sometimes is perceived as a wall. However, I think you first work within the confines of the law, clearly. Secondly, uh, that you then work within the system to help expand those barriers or knock some of those barriers down so you can achieve the vision you're trying to accomplish. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Hoffman. The next question is coming from Los Mochis, Sinaloa, Mexico, from the Colegio de Bachilleres. Good morning. I am calling from the Colegio de Bachilleres. The question is, the levels of commitment must be according to the groups of the, in, the interest group or the interests of the group or the institutional interests? I think the, the levels of commitment are really personal levels of commitment. Uh, and so, for example, if I become committed to something, to do something, uh, I will completely engage myself, all my resources and, and uh, thinking power or whatever, uh, to accomplish the task. Just as in our story, the, uh, uh, the journey of the sailor. Uh, the, as you look, though, and translate the commitment of people and look at the people within an organization, I think that you will recognize very quickly that different people are, have different levels of commitment. And I think the key here is that as you recognize that and encourage those people that might just be complying and trying to get them to the level, uh, the next level up of enrollment, uh, you really want to sort of put a time limit on it and say, you know, we have a goal that we're trying to achieve within a certain period of time. And if, in fact, you just choose not to join the organization to achieve that goal, it's okay for you to leave the organization. And then there are some very difficult decisions that you may have to make. In fact, I was with some CEOs yesterday in Dallas, Texas, and they were talking about this very issue of having some executives that, in fact, were not enrolled or committed to the vision that they had established and, in fact, had to remove them from the business. Those are very difficult decisions and decisions that they found extremely and personally uh, difficult to make, but ones that were important for the success of the organization. So in summary, I think you, the individuals have levels of commitment. As they come together in an organization, you attempt to get them engaged, you give them some time, but there comes a limit, and you have to define that limit, of how long you will allow them not to be engaged or enrolled or committed to achieving the goal of the business. Thank you, Mr. Hoffman. We have another call coming from the university in, from Medellin, Colombia. Uh, thank you. The question is coming from Medellin. What is the best way to um, show a vision so that this vision can be really shared by other people and to elicit real uh, commitment. I believe that there are several steps to uh, making sure that the vision is uh, understood and that, uh, that there is clarity uh, in how it is disseminated throughout the organization. First, I think that as the leadership group we need to understand what our vision is. And we'll create a set of words around that. However, it's extremely important after that that you engage the organization because how, in the understanding and help them define what the vision means to them. So, for example, <clears throat> if you have a vision to do something and I don't understand or I have a different understanding of some of the words that you've chosen to use in that vision or maybe I understand the word but I don't understand the breadth of the understanding that you have associated with that word until we sit down and have a face-to-face -face discussion or we discuss it in groups we do not have the opportunity to get a common understanding and what you're really searching for is the common understanding I think just because we make a statement and we might put it on the wall and assume that everyone understands it or knows what that means, I think is rather foolish and potentially a waste of time. I think what we want to do is we want to make a statement, maybe put it on the wall, but we need to engage the people into making it their own. Because once they understand what it is and believe that it's important, then in fact they'll take the ownership 
and will attack or try to overcome any obstacles to achieve it and hence move from maybe a level of compliance to a level of enrollment or potentially a level of, a level of total uh, commitment. There will always be some that won't commit at all, but that's part of, I think, the excitements of organizations as well as uh, some of the difficulties that we have to face. We continue with our session, and now we have another country calling, and this time it's from South America again, Paraguay, from the Catholic University in Paraguay, Asuncion, Paraguay. The question is as follows. Leadership, motivation, are they part of the strategy? And the vision vision is a product, is, is an elaboration of both aspects. How would you coordinate this vision, this strategic vision, and how do you apply it to an, a management in order to achieve excellence in the activities of a, an enterprise that is competing with others? Okay, I'm, I'm not sure I've gotten the whole question, but let me uh, respond uh, in this way. I believe that uh, leadership is a tool to help engage an organization to achieve a vision. So that leadership is critical in the process. Uh, and that the strategies around and the plans and how we achieve that are clearly things that the leaders need to be engaged in. Um, the execution of those plans is also, again, a, a clear role of the leader. As an organization that's in a competitive environment, uh, we may have similar visions about what we want to accomplish. However, then we step to the level that I think that you're getting at, of that there may be different strategies or a different set of values which will drive us to achieve that vision. And so there are some nuances there that are important. They're different in each organization, and I'm not sure that I'm getting to exactly the question, but uh, hopefully that helps uh, uh, clarify that. From Mexico, now we have uh, Tula de Allende. Is coming, the question is coming from the university, Technological University in Mexico. Good morning. The question is as follows. What are the steps that a leader must take in order to put into practice this uh, com the shared vision that you're talking about? Well, I think there, I'm not sure I have a lot of steps, uh, but I believe that the uh, first step is that the leader clearly has an understanding of what they want to accomplish or how they want the organization to move. I think, secondly, that the role of the leader is so critical in continuous communication of that vision, not only in words, but in behavior. And that as the leader has internalized that and lives the uh, actions to achieve that vision is where the power of the leader and the vision uh, uh, come from. Actually, power comes from the people, so I've got to be careful here. Uh, the, but the, that with the commitment that the individual leader makes, again, in understanding, talking about it, communicating it consistently, and then behaving along the same lines that they talk or walking the talk, is where people will know that the leader is engaged and is attempting to achieve this particular vision. If the leader wavers in any way, and again, uh, the meeting I had the last several days, this became a, a subject of conversation. If the leader wavers in any way, the people clearly see that. They understand it very quickly, and it allows them to have the excuse of saying, wait a minute, I don't think this guy or gal really believes it, and therefore, I'm not sure I'm going to commit my energies to follow or my energies to achieve the goal. So it becomes a understanding, a talking, and a living of the vision. 
Le damos ahora la bienvenida a la participación And now we are going to welcome Monterrey, Nuevo León, from the electrical company in Mexico. The question is as follows. Do you limit or restrict the development of a, an organizational vision to the um, financial capacity of the company? I would have to say that uh, the answer there is no, because I think one of the things, there, there are certain things you can do, number one, based on the financial capacity, and that we understand. However, if we don't have a vision beyond what we might be able to achieve, we may not generate the revenues or the profits to help us achieve the next level of it, uh, to get to a, a vision that will take us beyond. For example, I don't believe that um, a CEO that I visited with recently had a vision uh, that was limited by their $5,000 investment in creating a new company. That sounds like a very small vision if we have a $5,000 commitment in today's business world. However, that person's vision has created a $2 billion business with only a $5,000 investment at the beginning. And so in that sense, I don't think that we limit our visions to our current financial structure. Uh, and I think if we would look at some other businesses, such as the airline industries, which may have financial difficulty, uh, their vision may be delayed slightly as they restructure and get the correct financing. But in fact, their vision may not change or currently isn't limited by their lack of uh, current cash flow. Tenemos ahora en la línea Puerto Vallarta, Jalisco, del Centro Universitario de la Costa. Now we have Puerto Vallarta from Mexico. And I'm, he's calling from the University of Guadalajara, from the Coastal University. Why is it that within strategic vision you don't handle the financial aspect if we know that right now the problems are financial in most of the companies here in Mexico, for instance? What should we do with regard to that? Okay. Well, I don't want to downplay the, the importance of finance. I mean, we are in business, and we're in business to generate a profit. I think that the strategic planning process addresses the more immediate issues, and through whatever the current plans, the short-term plans are, to allow the business to have the flexibility to grow is where you need to concentrate or where I would concentrate my energies. I don't think that if AT&T doesn't have a, had or has a vision of being a global communications business, that if in fact we decided to, as a short term, limit our decisions not to do anything globally because of finances, that's okay. As we then change our financial structure, we can continue to go and move toward our vision. So one, one might say is the, uh, the distinction here, very long term of where we want to go and what, and what is our ultimate, how do we think the organization looks or what is it like. And there are intermediate steps to get there. And clearly the finances play a role. I don't want to downplay that at all. Uh, however, I think that that there are certain uh, in instances that the strategic planning and even the short-term planning is what one uses to uh, uh, as ways to overcome the barriers to get you to your ultimate vision. Un saludo muy cordial para la bellísima ciudad de Acapulco. Um, thank you very much. Acapulco Guerrero is now calling and in the Technological Institute from Acapulco. Um, good morning. I am calling from the El Sol, the journal in Acapulco. My question is, why? how can we apply the strategic vision in the new communications and the future communications techniques? Um, because all of the future technology is goes beyond any imagination. Well, that's probably part of the excitement of creating the vision uh, for the future. <coughs> uh, I believe that the it gives business and industries an opportunity to look at their current industry and then through the uh, te 
technological advances, the communications, uh, all of the, the things that are currently available to industry, use those as inputs to think about what are the possibilities for this industry or for this business that haven't been imagined if we try to incorporate some of these ideas. Yesterday on the airplane, I happened to see an article uh, about a new book that's just come out of Harvard Business School. Uh, and it talks about the fact that in, if we asked a series of businesses in the United States just recently what they thought the competitive edge was going to be in the year 2000, and 80% of the companies said quality. When they asked the same thing of the Japanese corporations, 80% of the Japanese corporations said redefining the industry having a new vision of what the industry can be based on the technologies that we haven't even imagined are that we, and things we can do based on the technologies we have today and new ones coming tomorrow. So recreating the industry is part of that vision which will drive a business, I think, to be successful in the future. Now, I'm not downplaying the importance of quality. It just happens to be the, uh, uh, the research that was just released on, on that subject. Next question comes from Mexico City, and that's an electrical company. Thank you. I would like to congratulate you for this wonderful organization of um, video conferences. The question is, what is the difference if, it is, if there is a difference between economic globalization and strategic vision? And I want to know if you have um, incorporated the political classes, cultural classes, and social classes, and what is the, the role that uh, governments play in the economic or financial globalization? Well, that sub that's a very large question, <laughs> and I'm not sure that I have the answer to, uh, to all of that. In fact, I know I don't have the answer to uh, uh, the nuances of the question. I think uh, looking at it from the strategic vision perspective uh, is there, there are a couple of elements, one of which I'll talk about in the next segment of, of my talk. But first is that as you want to expand in the global market, what is it that you have as your vision for your business? Secondly, the behavior of how the people act within the global environment clearly is uh, understood and monitored by the cultural differences. And so that is it's very important for you as a business, as you expand globally, that you have a clearly defined set of values as a business so that no matter where people are in the world, they, in fact, have an understanding of what the business stands for and what your value system is, and that allows them to behave in such a way that is consistent with the philosophies of your business. Uh, that, in terms of, of um, global expansion and, and e the global economy, uh, I'm not sure I understand all those nuances, uh, and so I hope that I've only given you a part of your answer uh, and that maybe through these broadcasts we can fill in some of the other answers at a later time. We are now um, receiving a call from Mexico, from Pemex, Mexican Petroleum Company. Good morning. I just have a couple of questions. The American Dream, can you say that it's a vision from the American people? That's the first question. And second, uh, having a vision of a de from a development, developed country, will that help to create another vision on, a, on an individual level, coming from a developed country? Uh, when I say the American dream is created by Americans, I would say that the American dream was created by whoever the people were, wherever they came from, that had a vision in their heart to create a country, 
uh, that was founded on the principles of freedom and the principles of respect for each other. And then created the infrastructure to support them to achieve that goal. As the, a culture matures, does the vision ultimately have to change? Joel Barker talks about that in his The Power of Vision uh, videotape that he's released and some others. And he suggests that the reason Rome fell, or the reason that the Greek Empire fell, or the, Greek, the reason that the Egyptian Empire fell, was that as a culture they had a vision initially, and that the vision did not change or grow as the culture matured. And therefore, they lost the power of the vision creating organized movement to achieve something. Without the vision, the people started doing multiple things and clearly different behaviors started to emerge. I also think that the United States happens to be at a point where I'm not sure we are